Uh, good morning, everyone. I think we'll get started. Thank you. My name is Sue Collins. I'm a member of the political science faculty here at Notre Dame, and my job is simple today to introduce our distinguished speaker, um, who is giving a talk entitled, a, a wonderful title, Virtuous Evildoers. Um, our speaker today is Gilbert Mylander. He is the Paul Ramsey Fellow at the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture and the Emeritus Phyllis and Richard Duesenberg Chair in Christian Ethics at Valparaiso University, where he's taught since 1960, 1996. Uh, prior to his time at Valparaiso, uh, Professor Mylander taught at the University of Virginia and at Oberlin College. He earned his PhD degree at Princeton University in 1976. Uh, Professor Mylander served on the President's Council on Bioethics from 2002 to 2009 and is a distinguished fellow with the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity. He has published 13 books and numerous articles, among them Friendship, a Study in Theological Ethics, Bioethics, a Primer for Christians, Neither Beast Nor God, The Dignity of the Human Person, Should We Live Forever? The Ethical Ambiguities of Aging, and Working, Its Meaning and Its Limits. He is co-editor with William um, Werpachowski of the Oxford Handbook of Theological Ethics. He has served on the board of directors and uh, of the Society of Christian Ethics as an associate editor of Religious Studies Review and as an associate editor of the Journal of Religious Ethics. He's a busy man. His most recent book is Not by Nature but by Grace, Forming Families Through Adoption, the first installment in the Notre Dame Center for Ethic, Ethics and Culture's book series with Notre Dame Press titled, quote, Catholic Ideas for a Secular World. The title of his lecture, as I said today, is Virtuous Evildoers. Let us give a fine welcome, fine Notre Dame welcome to Professor Mylander. Thank you very much, Susan. Can you hear me okay? It seems like it's picking me up. Wave your hand if, uh, if I start to mumble. When uh, Carter Sneed suggested to me that I think about giving... May I have your attention, please? The next sessions will be starting shortly. Please make your way to the appropriate room at this time. We're ahead of the game. You, you were not patient enough. <laughs> it was 10.45. I want to give as much time as possible. We're on time. Thank you. Uh, anyway, when, uh, when Carter suggested to me that I uh, think about doing a, a talk at this conference, I asked him what the, what the theme of the conference was going to be, to which he replied, good and evil. Uh, and I said, well, it's a little narrow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can think of something to fit under that uh, that scheme, but I think I think I that what I'm doing does uh, fall under the theme. But I wanted to say before sort of launching into the talk itself that you know, what I think of myself as trying to do here is is puzzle over something with you that that I at least find sort of puzzling, and maybe uh, some of you will also. I mean, I will move eventually in the talk toward trying to uh, say something constructive uh, about it. But in some respects, for me, at least on this topic, the questions are almost more interesting. Than May I have your attention, please? <laughs> well, she's got our attention. <laughs> I just don't know if she plans to use it. <laughs> Conference guests? Please make your way to the auditorium or the lower level. The session for this time slot has begun. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it now. But anyway, as I was saying, in some ways the questions are more interesting than the answers for me here. But we'll just see where we go. At the end of Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, Brutus and Cassius, the conspirators who had assassinated Caesar, are themselves now dead. Brutus has in fact fallen upon his sword rather than face capture by the armies of Octavian and Mark Antony. Brutus was bad enough to betray and murder a man who had been his good friend, 
but he was not quite bad enough to be a really successful rebel. For he had parted company with his fellow conspirators, refusing to approve killing Mark Antony, and that sense of honor has now cost him dearly. After his death, Brutus is praised in the famous words that Shakespeare places into Antony's mouth, this was the noblest Roman of them all. There are, of course, other ways we might have thought to describe Brutus as traitor, rebel, assassin, for example, and no doubt one might have used such terms to describe some of Brutus's fellow conspirators. But not Brutus, at least not according to Antony, who says, his life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. And if we ask for a reason why we should praise rather than dishonor Brutus, Anthony points to a certain virtue he had displayed even as an assassin. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. And Octavian, soon to be Caesar, agrees. According to his virtue, let us use him with all respect and rites of burial. Within my tent, his bones tonight shall lie, most like a soldier, ordered honorably. In Dante's Inferno, however, Brutus has a quite different final resting place. Not in the tent of one who would soon be Caesar, but in the nethermost regions of hell, alongside Cassius and Judas, all betrayers of those, whether in empire or church, to whom they had been bound by special ties of loyalty. There seems on the face of it no reason to admire or praise them. And perhaps we should note, remind ourselves, that Brutus is not the only person who is placed by Dante in deepest hell, but whose character may actually be a little more complicated than that location would at first suggest. The character of Judas has, after all, seemed baffling and mysterious to many people who have puzzled over the Gospel's accounts of his betrayal of Jesus. So mysterious that, for example, Karl Barth could devote a searching 47-page small print excursus in his Church Dogmatics to exploring the fact that, as Barth puts it, the more profoundly and comprehensively we attempt to formulate the sin and guilt of Judas, the more nearly his will and deed approach what God willed and did in this matter. Judas hands over Jesus, but in so doing, he simply does what God has already done. There is, Bart says here, nothing to venerate or to despise. We can only say that in the mysterious working of divine grace, even Judas is not exempt from positive service. And we are tempted, perhaps very tempted sometimes, to see in Judas a tragic figure a decent man caught up in faithful, mysterious events well beyond his ken. However, as I noted, Dante doesn't evidently think of him quite that way. And this is certainly not because Dante lacks any sense of the complexity and ambiguity of human character, any sense that there might be such a thing as a virtuous evildoer. At one point in the Inferno, Dante encounters the, the false counselors, as he calls them, those who had used their intellectual gifts to persuade others to engage in fraudulent practices. And among these is Ulysses, the brains behind the scheme of the Trojan horse. And he recounts his story to Dante. And in a passage that Dorothy Sayers called perhaps the most beautiful thing in the whole inferno, a passage that is evidently Dante's own invention, and is certainly not found in Homer, Dante describes Ulysses' last voyage. Ulysses has made it home safely from his years of wandering after the Trojan Wars. He has returned to his home and to Ithaca, where he is now to rule. But in this invention of Dante's, Ulysses explains why he couldn't stay there, why he had to leave. He says, no tenderness for my son, nor piety to my old father, nor the wedded love that should have comforted Penelope could conquer in me the restless itch to rove and rummage through the world, exploring it, all human worth and wickedness to prove. So on the deep and open sea I set forth with a single ship and that small band of comrades that had never left me yet. So they set sail together once more. They reached the very boundary of the inhabited world, as they know it at least, 
And Ulysses urges his shipmates to keep on going, to go still farther so that they may experience the, the, the utterly unknown, an experience, he says, of the uninhabited world behind the sun. He says to them, think of your breed. For brutish ignorance, your metal was not made. You were made men to follow after knowledge and excellence. So they forge ahead, only to sail into a storm that whirls the ship around three times, lifts the poop deck high, and plunges the prow down into the water. And Ulysses says, over our heads, the hollow seas closed up. Now, when we remember that Ulysses is in hell, that as a false counselor, he has encouraged fraud, the point of this evidently invented tale might at first seem clear. We might take it as a warning to Dante's readers, a warning that, in the words of John Sinclair, an eternal and insatiable human hunger and quest after knowledge of the world may recoil on us, that that hunger is vice, not virtue. A restless desire to know without limits, to sail uncharted waters, may, as it seems to in this case, subvert even the deepest loyalties of human life, to home, to wife, to father, to son. So we might well take this passage as a warning, and maybe that's the way we should take it. And yet Sinclair immediately adds, as we read it, we forget the sin in contemplation of the sinner's greatness, that characteristically human search after knowledge and excellence that moves him, a greatness that Dante evidently is quite able to savor and appreciate, and that once again may well strike us in some ways as, as tragic. How we might wonder is it that Ulysses' proud description of his last voyage, a voyage that leaves behind the deepest human ties in order to scratch that restless itch for human mastery, a tale told by one who quite literally is damned, how should this tale have been made so enticing and compelling an account of the human need to follow after knowledge and excellence? The goods of life are not easily reconciled, and evil may be done with great dignity and appeal, done even bravely and sacrificially by those we can hardly help but admire. Or at least maybe I should say by those I can hardly help but admire. I shouldn't co-opt you too quickly uh, <laughs> into, my, uh, into my thesis here. Perhaps, however, it's a possibility that what we are admiring here is not virtue, really, but simply what we might call alluring vice. Although Augustine may never actually use the term splendid vice, he certainly has a concept that deserves that name. So, for example, while granting that true virtue is not possible apart from worship of the true God, Augustine can know and speak of what he calls a virtue which is employed in the service, a virtue which is employed in the service of human glory. It may not be true virtue, but men, he says, are of more service to the earthly city when they possess even that sort of virtue than if they are without it. It may not make them saints, he says, but it surely makes them less depraved men. And when in Book One of the City of God, he tells the story of Marcus Regulus, who urged his fellow Romans not to accept the terms of peace offered by the Carthaginians, and then kept the oath he had made that he would return to Carthage if those terms were not accepted, and who was then horribly tortured to death, it is clear that Augustine simply cannot withhold his admiration. The ancient Romans were certainly right, he says, to praise a courage which rose superior so, to so dreadful a fate. Noble Romans such as Regulus were fighting for their earthly country. The gods they worshipped were false, but their worship was genuine, and they faithfully kept their oaths. Something like that sort of splendid vice, with all its tragic ambiguity and ambivalence, has enormous appeal, and it may be what Dante had in mind when he invented that last voyage of Ulysses. Perhaps it is time for me to step back from these for me at least, striking examples of what we might call virtuous evildoers and make clear what I do not mean by this notion and what problem I'm not, at least for now, worrying about. I do not have in mind the standard sort of utilitarian question, shall we do what might usually be thought of as evil, because in these particular, perhaps unusual or terrible circumstances, doing so looks as if it would lead to the best consequences on the whole. 
I don't mean that's an unimportant question, but after all, if we really think in utilitarian terms, then the one who acts in a way that, however seemingly problematic, uh, promises to produce the best possible outcome is not an evildoer, not on utilitarian terms. To be sure, the, the temptation to reason in this way, in that utilitarian way, is quite understandable and often very powerful, and it points to some troubling questions that many people have often noted. Does the moral world of our everyday uh, uh, life ex experience make coherent sense? Is it actually possible to make the, the good and the right fit together in this kind of world? These are important questions, but my problem here is a little different having to do less with the coherence of the moral universe and more with the complexities of human character, with the fact that, at least as it seems to me, evil may be done in strikingly virtuous and honorable ways. The vicious may at least seem to be virtuous, and not only in separate moments, but in one and the same moment. Vice really may be splint, or so it seemed to Augustine, and seems to me to go from the greater to the lesser. So, for example, General Rommel, while pursuing the war aims of Hitler's regime, nevertheless burned an order issued by Hitler in 1942, an order calling for all enemy soldiers caught behind German lines to be summarily executed. Rommel just burned the order. Are we not inclined to praise him for this, even while regretting or perhaps even deploring his willingness to put his training and skill in service of the German war effort. I take that example from Michael Walzer, whose writing has often displayed a keen eye for such moral complexities, and from whom we may take yet one more example. As an illustration of a terrorist, a terrorist who adheres to a code of honor, Walzer points to Camus' play, The Just Assassins. Walzer writes, describing it, in the early 20th century, a group of Russian revolutionaries decided to kill a czarist official, the Grand Duke Sergei, a man personally involved in the repression of radical activity. They planned to blow him up in his carriage, and on the appointed day, one of their number was in place along the Grand Duke's usual route. As the carriage drew near the young revolutionary, a bomb hidden under his coat noticed that his victim was not alone. On his lap, he held two small children. The would-be assassin looked, hesitated, then walked quickly away. He would wait for another occasion. Camus has one of his comrades say, accepting this decision, even in destruction there's a right way and a wrong way, and there are limits. And here again, we may find ourselves admiring a man, admiring a man who in that very moment is actually prepared to do a terrorist deed from which we might well recoil, and find ourselves admiring him at the very moment when he's prepared to do it. Although my reflection on this problem of the virtuous evildoer is about to take a more theoretical turn, it is worth at least noting that thinking about the problem might teach us some useful practical lessons in our current cultural climate. The state of Maryland recently removed from its state house grounds a statue of Roger Taney, who had been Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court in the years before the Civil War. Taney was a Roman Catholic. He did not support the Confederacy, but he was the author of the Dred Scott decision, the, the uh, infamous Dred Scott decision, which held that a black man, even when living in a free state, was not entitled to his freedom, and that African Americans could never be citizens of the United States. And commenting approvingly on the removal of the Taney statue, Bishop Edward Braxton of Belleville, Illinois, recently asked, why we as a people should honor in a place of prominence someone like Taney. He was apparently, Braxton observed, a very good Catholic, a very good person in many ways, but this, meaning his uh, authorship of the Dred Scott decision, but this is a flaw at the foundation that feeds all the rest of this. A great enough flaw, evidently, to downplay the adjective virtuous and underscore the noun evildoer. Perhaps, however, Chief Justice Taney is a relatively easy mark. I do not know how best to deal with the many public monuments honoring men who have played significant roles in our history, while also displaying what, uh, are also, what, what to us now are, to put it uh, sort of gently, feet of clay. But I am certain that if we may only honor those of unblemished character, we will save a lot of money on monuments. 
So, for example, while the near reverence shown the memory of General Robert E. Lee, I don't know whether they still do or not, but if you've never been to Washington and Lee uh, University and seen the Lee burial crypt and um, listened to the reverent tones with which the guide, uh, uh, generally the uh, nice uh, elderly southern woman, uh, describes uh, General Lee, um, you uh, will understand that the term reverence is uh, an appropriate term. Uh, here. At any rate, while the near reverence shown in the memory of General Robert E. Lee has probably been overdone and must be in part a product of a lost cause myth of the virtuous South, should we dishonor him while honoring General Sheridan, who, under Grant's command, on the right side of things, uh, ordered his troops to burn the crops in the Shenandoah Valley, famously saying that he left it so decimated that even a crow flying over the Shenandoah would have to carry its own provisions? A public culture that lacks any sense of splendid vice can, I'm afraid, hardly avoid a too simple vision of the moral life, a vision that divides the world into the virtuous and the vicious. But such a vision is at least sometimes more likely to invite hypocrisy than insight. I turn now, finally, to the theoretical issue, or at least a theoretical issue, that is, I think, lurking in the problem of the virtuous evildoer. In the problem of Thor Bridge, one of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories, Dr. Watson describes in the following way a Mr. Neil Gibson who has come to consult with Holmes. His tall, gaunt, craggy figure had a suggestion of hunger and rapacity, and Abraham Lincoln keyed to base uses instead of high ones would give some idea of the man. Now here's an interesting question. Can we imagine a man with Lincoln's considerable virtues, but with those virtues keyed to base uses instead of high ones? Is that possible? This, of course, is the very old question of the unity of the virtues. Are the virtues one? Must a person who possesses one virtue necessarily have them all? Or if we lack one, must we ultimately lack all? Can we have them? piecemeal or not. Whether or not Augustine developed precisely a notion of splendid vice, that way of thinking, thinking in terms of a concept of splendid vice, seems clearly connected to the belief that the virtues are one, and that we cannot really have any of the virtues, really truly have any of them, apart from the others. For according to that view, unless our loves are rightly ordered toward God, everything else in our character must inevitably be distorted. On that view, even the self-sacrificing courage of a Marcus, Marcus Regulus, self-sacrificing courage in honor of the wrong god, uh, uh, his courage is only a pale imitation and, in the end, a deceptive imitation of true virtue. And from that perspective, we can perhaps appreciate why someone might think that even though Thomas Jefferson was willing to pledge his life, his fortune, and his sacred honor in defense of a country whose declaration of independence he penned and which he served with great distinction, his manifest moral flaws make him an unfit subject for public esteem. Even his best and most notable traits are, in the end, from this perspective, vices, not virtues. Such judgments may seem harsh. Uh, they are harsh, uh, in fact. Uh, but they flow consistently from the concept of splendid vice and the unity of the virtues. From this perspective, what looks like courage in the service of an unjust cause is a false courage. It's not the true thing. Conflicts within the moral life are not tragic. They do not result from the fact that the goods of this life cannot be reconciled. They flow from the flaws in our character. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, Cassius says. Had Lincoln's character been keyed to base uses rather than high ones, he could not have displayed the virtues we ascribe to him. Not if the virtues really are one. Not on this view. If so, then remembering Sinclair's phrase that I used earlier with respect to Dante, if so, then there can be no willingness to forget the sin in contemplation of the sinner's greatness. Regulus is not to be praised. The, the soldier who fights bravely in an unjust cause is not really courageous. Treating others justly because we are too proud to be seen doing otherwise is not really true justice. We cannot develop virtues in order to pursue vice we cannot, for instance, act with genuine temperance and self-control if our goal in acting that way is simply to become as wealthy as possible 
no reason to admire Ben Franklin uh, either, it appears. We may well think that such a harsh view is counterintuitive, perhaps even bizarre. For taken seriously, it would mean that none of us is truly virtuous. But wait, that is, after all, what the psalmist says. No man living is righteous before thee. And St. Paul seems to be on board with something like the same idea. There's something to that. If my love is not steadfastly directed toward God, the whole of my character can hardly help but be disordered. That is one angle of vision and an angle that always needs to be taken seriously. But there is also another angle. Even in the dark of night, as Helmut Tilke said, not all cats are gray. Even granting that the best of our virtues is always tainted, it still seems possible to make distinctions. Augustine praised Regulus and other ancient Romans. He did not so praise the Romans of his own day, whom he thought basically pretty corrupt, and who no longer suppressed many vices in service of Rome's glory. Or, as Michael Walzer writes, with respect to the rules of war and the belief that war is hell, even in hell, it is possible to be more or less humane. Even there, he says, we can carve out a constitutional regime in hell. The contrast between these two angles of vision, between a concept of the unity of the virtues and a belief that we can acquire and possess the virtues piecemeal, will be apparent if we consider two ways that we have of describing the relation between our natural virtues and the grace-given virtue of love for God. On the one hand, we may say that the grace-given virtue of love presupposes and does not invalidate the presence of our natural virtues. Hence, they must really be there to be presupposed. They are drawn up into a life directed toward God, but they are virtues even apart from that. On the other hand, we may also say that when these natural virtues are drawn up into a life directed toward the love of God, they are transformed and perfected. And if in need of transformation on the way to perfection, they must to some degree be deficient and distorted, not the genuine article, but more like splendid vice. There's a mystery hidden in this notion of perfection, a mystery that should, that should keep us from be, being too confident about our supposed virtues. As Joseph Pieper put it, it is simply in the nature of the thing that the apprentice can have no specific idea what the, what the perfection of mastery looks like from inside and all that it is going to demand of him. I think, in fact, that these two angles of vision as ways of thinking about uh, the unity of the virtues as uh, uh, grace uh, presupposing or grace perfecting our uh, natural virtues, I think that uh, one can, in fact, read Aquinas in uh, either of those ways and make a case for it, though I wouldn't even venture into that territory uh, here. At, uh, <laughs> at Notre Dame. I will leave that entirely to, uh, to others. We are likely to think, I myself often tend to think, that an air of the tragic permeates this discussion. A great man like Regulus serving a false god, an honorable man like Rommel caught up in the wrong cause, the noblest Roman of them all, a garden variety assassin, a man as honorable as Robert E. Lee put in his skill in service of an evil regime. Ulysses' brave surge to see and know what no human being has ever seen, stained by a willingness to leave behind those who love and depend on him. Judas' necessary participation in God's redemptive handling, handing over his son to those intent on destroying him. There would be something wrong with us if we were entirely unmoved by such examples. But we should not simply wring our hands and bewail our fate. We pay a price for savoring the tragic too much. And the price we pay is that we lose the sense that we are always on the way, and that to seek virtue is to embark on a journey that requires more than just the piecemeal acquisition of certain character traits. It does require a transformation of who we are. To put the matter more theologically, we might say that the unity of the virtues is an eschatological possibility, the end of the journey, not a rest stop along the way. And it should be no surprise that when we forget this, our public life becomes increasingly shrill, driven by a desire for purity here and now. 
One final example. You needed a uh, Lutheran example. <laughs> I can never resist that, I'm sorry. <laughs> In, in After Ten Years, a little piece titled After Ten Years, the famous reckoning addressed to his fellow conspirators, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, the great masquerade of evil has played havoc with all our ethical concepts. And among those concepts that had become sort of unraveled uh, in Bonhoeffer's experience was that of virtue. He was not, on the one hand, he was not prepared simply to criticize his fellow Germans who had supported and even died for the Nazi regime. Who would deny, he writes, who would deny that in obedience, in their task and calling, the Germans have again and again shown the utmost bravery and self-sacrifice, sure of the estimable virtues. They took their calling as citizens of the German realm seriously, and they tried to live it out faithfully. And yet, Bonhoeffer says something was lacking in those seemingly virtuous Germans. They could not see the need, he says, for free and responsible action even in opposition to what they took to be their calling. They couldn't see what actually really needed to be seen at that time, and hence they served evil. But it was not only those other German citizens who had become virtuous evildoers. In what is surely the most famous passage, an off-sided passage from after 10 years, at least off-sided in the proper circles. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, uh, Bonhoeffer wonders whether the, in his mind, necessary evil doing in which he and his fellow conspirators have engaged can possibly be the work of virtuous people. And he wonders you know, whether they can regain their virtue after this is all over. And he writes, we have been silent witnesses of evil deeds. We have been drenched by many storms. We have learned the arts of equivocation and pretense. Experience has made us suspicious of others and kept us from being truthful and open. Are we still of any use? What we shall need is not geniuses or cynics or misanthropes or clever tacticians, but plain, honest, straightforward men. Will our inward power of resistance be strong enough and our honesty with ourselves remorseless enough for us to find our way back to simplicity and straightforwardness? And it's very striking, as one scholar has put it, remembering, pointing to Bonhoeffer's earlier book, uh, The Cost of Discipleship, which is a, uh, a sort of study of the Sermon on the Mount. It's very striking, uh, this scholar writes, that the theologian, Bonhoeffer, who wrote arguably the 20th century's most influential book on the Sermon on the Mount, is not able now to let his yes be yes and his no be no. He can't just be straightforwardly virtuous in the circumstances in which he finds himself. Much of Bonhoeffer's theological reflection was necessarily focused on this problem. How ought Christians live responsibly or virtuously in a world that seemed to offer only tragic choices? Just to immerse themselves in the world, accepting its mix of good and evil, just to act as virtuously as they could in such circumstances, but to do so without any sense of being on the way to something something more truly virtuous, that would be to believe in a God who could do no better than the tragic. And yet, of course, to try to live only in the light of God's ultimate judgment would be to act as if this evil world were not even now a fit place for human habitation, and yet it is. So Bonhoeffer writes in his Ethics, in Jesus Christ we have faith in the incarnate, crucified, and risen God. In the incarnation we learn of the love of God for his creation, in the crucifixion, we learn of the judgment of God upon all flesh. And in the resurrection, we learn of God's will for a new, ro new world. There could be no greater error than to tear these three elements apart. So the story of that man Jesus in these three acts, creation, incarnation, uh, crucifixion, and resurrection, <coughs> the story of Jesus in those three acts is not a tragedy, although it makes place for the tragic. It does not depict a world forever condemned to display at best virtuous evildoers. But of course it also does not solve the problem of the virtuous evildoer if by solve we have in mind a theoretical solution which you will by now have noticed I am not really uh, offering. Uh, rather it invites us to enter into that story and to live within it as faithfully as we are able. 
Christian life, Bonhoeffer writes, is participation in the encounter of Christ with the world, that threefold encounter of Christ with the world. And thus to participate is to be on the way, on the way toward a day and a new creation in which the virtues truly are one and virtuous evildoers are no more. Thank you. My idea would have been that the virtues, one evokes the other or entails the other, and there should be an openness of following this lead on to the end. But the encouragement I got was that uh, the unity of virtues is really a step <coughs> Because though we are imperfect beings, we are perfectible, and that perfection comes from the other end. So within the context of this impossibility of virtuous evil doers, I've read I wish to I know how you would see the possibility of, or rather, how you would interpret what I regard as the hypocrisy of war crimes. Because is, it, is there really any decent way of killing a human being? Any virtuous way of killing a human being? And that would also apply to various means of that the death penalty. Thank you. Were you all able to hear him? Okay, got the question. That's too bad, since I have to answer it. Um, um, well, the, I mean, there, there, are, there are several uh, uh, levels going on in your question, but let me try to distinguish a couple things. Um, unless we are pacifists, um, there is a difference between a war crime and a killing. And, uh, killing of a human being in warfare. There may be uh, killings by soldiers in war that are uh, uh, just, uh, unless, we're pat unless we think that all killing uh, is wrong. Um, so that a war crime is, um, uh, is a killing that in, in one way or another um, violates the accepted uh, rules of just war. Maybe um, target civilians, for instance, or um, uh, murders prisoners, uh, or, or something like that. Um, uh, now, if I mean, you, you may want to come, you may want to come back to question the distinction. I understand that, but but if we just confine ourselves to war crimes, to that level of your question, you asked, um, uh, you know, whether there was any way, any way to think of them as other than horrible, um, uh, and I think the simple answer to that is no. Of course, there's not. Okay, there's a kind of inhumanity there that uh, we can't find acceptable. Um, it's still very hard to know what to say about uh, uh, certain uh, certain things. Um, for instance, I'll take the so what was sort of one of the classic cases when uh, the Second World War began. Uh, at the outset of it, it was essentially Britain opposing uh, Germany, um, and the uh, the state of British uh, air technology at the time was such that, supposedly, at least, and I take this to be true, the, uh, uh, the only way they could mount any uh, uh, opposition to uh, Hitler's forces was simply to uh, uh, target cities and to bomb them. Um, now, that's a war crime. Um, uh, and they kept on doing it long after that in the war when their technology was uh, sufficiently developed that they didn't need to any longer. And the United States, of course, joined in, we famously uh, 
burn uh, some German cities with bombing. Um, uh, what should we say about Britain's uh, bracketing all all what all that was done later? What should we say about Britain's opposition early in the war when, if they were to oppose an opponent that you might say had to be opposed, there was no other way to do it? Is it? in any sense, virtuous evil doing, uh, you see, at that point. Um, I'm not prepared to endorse what they did. I'm also not prepared to say that I know exactly what I would have decided to do in the same circumstances. Um, and there are moments when uh, uh, most of us would be glad not to be the uh, political figures who have to make those decisions. You know, is Churchill a great man or not? Um, uh, he was, after all, the one who authorized it, uh, finally. Um, uh, and there are, uh, there are interesting uh, stories. Uh, Michael Walzer discusses it nicely in his, uh, his great book, Just and Unjust Wars. The, the, the commander of the, uh, the British Bomber Command, um, the, that is to say the, the separate part of their air force that specifically bombed cities was a guy named Arthur Harris, um, who expected to be knighted after the war um, and was bitterly disappointed uh, that he was not. He was. Uh, dishonored uh, to some degree, although it's still a matter of some debate among folks in Britain. And um, he finally just left and went back to his native Rhodesia. Um, so uh, war crimes, I'm not prepared to say that something like that is right. Um, I'm, I'm not certain what I would say, what I would do in the same circumstances. That's the best I can do for an answer. Oh. I guess I am moderating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know um, if there's a microphone in the, is there a, an extra microphone? I'll repeat the question. Yeah, so, so okay. you'll have to repeat it also because it's being videoed and I just started oh. to be picked up. Okay. Well, for our sake, I'll try to be loud. Yeah. I can get on the recording. I'm sorry. Uh, your talk, I appreciate it very much. It puts me in mind of a passage from the Republic of Plato. In book six, uh, he's describing the philosophic nature and when it goes bad. It goes really bad, right? So your Abraham Lincoln would speak with the base motive. But the philosophic nature um, is a good rememberer, a good learner, charming, magnificent, and a friend of moderation, uh, justice, and truth. And I wondered if something like when we're united to God and his communion of saints, a full union means full union with everyone. But on our way, there's that guy I kind of think is a jerk, I don't really like him, but I want to be united to God. I wonder if Plato is putting in this language, we're friends of the virtues, might explain something that's going on here that full union with God and full unity of the virtues has something to do with the kind of inability we have to be united to other people because our friendships with everyone are somehow lacking. Did you hear him okay? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what uh, uh, what I want to say in response to that. Um, uh, the uh, are, are you uh, maybe I don't understand what you're saying. Are you saying that full union with God is possible apart from union with others? It seems to me there's a parallel problem. But I want to be fully united to Christ and His Church, but lack of union with my neighbor is a threat to my full union with Christ or vice versa. It seems like the problem with the virtuous evildoer is the same kind of problem. Um, I, I'm missing something here. You're, 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 certain, I, I don't, I, you're certainly right that uh, a failure to be at one with uh, any of my neighbors um, must inevitably um, reflect something about my relation uh, to God. Um, I would have thought that the, uh, the failure to be at one with my neighbors, though, that, that there's the direction of movement is the other way, that, that it, it's the, the fact of my uh, alienation from God that inevitably uh, distorts my relation uh, with others. Um, uh, now, Okay, maybe I see where we're heading. So could, by, by improving that relation with the neighbors, am I thereby in some way improving my relation with God? Um, 
that's not the direct again that's not the direction of movement um, uh, that I, uh, I I would usually think of but it is true that um, uh, it's impossible to imagine the end of this journey where the two are not in sync um, uh, sort of but I don't know I'm, I'm, I'm missing something you, you can grab me afterwards and explain to me what you're uh, yes Richard uh, yeah, I'll try to be loud too. Uh, I can't resist one comment, but I do also have a question uh, about your Lutheran example. Uh, in Mark Riebling's book, Church of Spies, he notes that there were both Protestants and Catholics involved in the plot against Hitler. And the Protestants uh, really agonized deeply about whether you could assassinate even a man like Hitler. But the Jesuits and other Catholic priests who were involved in Red Thomas Aquinas on when you can depose a tyrant, they had no problem at all. <laughs> uh, but the question is more serious. Uh, the other example I think, I think of, in one way a similar problem, is the problem of the deathbed conversion. Uh, the good thief described at least in one of the Gospels as uh, apparently having lived a life of complete vice and saying, admitting, we deserve this, uh, but this man does not. And, uh, and because of one sentence to Jesus is told he will be with him this day in paradise. You have uh, answers to criticism of this about the Old Testament. God says, you say my ways are unfair, but my way is the fair one, that if the sinner turns, uh, he, he has the kingdom. And the Jesus with the parable of the uh, uh, workers in the field at different times, if this guy worked only an hour, he gets the same thing I do. You can hardly imagine that the virtues could even be infused in such a person in this moment of repentance. Is that a, a, a kind of similar problem that God's mercy seems to overcome uh, even great evil at the first sign of repentance at the end of one's life? That's, that's very nice. Um, uh, and I will respond to it, but First, just one more word on Bonhoeffer. <laughs> um, uh, no, and this, this is actually, this is to reinforce uh, what you said about it. Um, uh, Larry Asmussen wrote a book, he actually wrote a couple books about Bonhoeffer, but his first one years and years ago. Um, it talks about the circle of conspirators, co-conspirators that Bonhoeffer was involved in. He was sort of like the father confessor uh, for them all, you know, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, just as you described it, they, they agonized over whether this kind of evil doing could possibly be uh, appropriate uh, for them to do and everything. And uh, Rasmussen says at one point, uh, Rasmussen argues that it, it was paralyzing for them. It, it made them ineffective uh, as conspirators. And he says at one point that they would have been, if they, and, oh, and he says, you know, they, they always talk about the freedom, the gospel will free us to do this, you know, but we're agonizing over this deed all the time. He says if they were really freed by the gospel, they would have hired a thug who knew how to get the job done. Um, uh, and, <laughs> so, um, but the, uh, the the dying thief and uh, his uh, his like um, that that is an interesting case. Of course, there there have always been certain uh, strands uh, in the Christian tradition that have exalted the dying thief precisely because he um, uh, he wasn't a great theologian, he wasn't an instructor, and he just turned to Jesus, uh, you know, and uh, uh, that was uh, was and is all that is um, uh, needed. Um, I suppose, Richard, I suppose if you've got a strong view of purgatory, you can, you can figure out a way to, uh, uh, to solve this uh, problem, um, to gradually inculcate uh, a fuller virtue in uh, this, uh, uh, this guy. Um, uh, but I don't know. Um, I'm not prepared to say that a... Uh, a remarkable transformation of character cannot be um, uh, accomplished by the grace of God, and the um, uh, and it is true that the, like the passage of the, la the different laborers in the uh, vineyard who get paid the same amount for the different hours of work. Um, the notion of divine grace, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr says at one point, the notion of divine grace has always been offensive to pure moralists. Um, uh, I mean, there is something uh, uh, a, a little offensive about it, but um, uh, it, I, I guess I don't see any reason in principle why God being God can't transform our character overnight 
so to speak. Um, we don't seem to manage that ourselves. It's a laborious process uh, for us along the way. Um, uh, but um, uh, in principle, at least, it, it, virtuous habits of behavior could be we could be zapped with them um, uh, suddenly. But I grant you, it's, it's, it's a very unusual notion of virtue uh, at that point, uh, to think of it as possible in that way. And um, uh, we may need a more developed theological system that makes place for something like purgatory uh, to accomplish that. Yes, yes, and she did you hear her? She said, somewhat erroneously, um, uh, that the the agony of the Lutheran conspirators, which was which was real uh, in, uh, during the Nazi years, um, comes from Luther himself, who um, who uh, taught that one was, was not to oppose uh, the ruler. It's the old Romans thirteen passage uh, was really uh, what's at work there. Um, uh, Luther's views are actually more complex uh, on that. He, um, uh, he altered his views somewhat uh, over time. And so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that their agonizing is necessarily due to Luther, per se. It is due to a certain reading of Romans 13, um, uh, that um, uh, the one who bears the sword bears it as God's representative, and uh, we have a, a duty to uh, obey. Um, now, I'd want to take that Romans 13 passage and kind of look at it in its context. I think there are things you can do with it there. But just as a matter of historical fact, you're right that uh, I, I think it's not simply uh, or even primarily Luther, but it is uh, a certain received understanding of how to read Romans 13. That was writing in regard to the peasant war, you would that. Well, the, the, the peasant war wasn't the, the issue there wasn't so much. I mean, Luther did not do himself proud in the peasant war. Um, uh, uh, if you know anything about it, when he urged the princes to smite, stab, and slay uh, the, uh, the peasants. Um, uh, but um, uh, the, the issue there was not so much uh, uh, unquestioning obedience to uh, rulers um, as um, uh, a certain fear of social chaos and anarchy uh, that was uh, at work. But, um, uh, but I say, you're right that, that Luther... <laughs> Luther certainly, um, uh, in some of the writing, in some of his writings, uh, takes a kind of standard view of what Romans 13 requires. But um, he, he did develop it uh, uh, to somewhat, uh, to some degree, the, the sort of distinctions among princes and rulers and uh, to whom one owed this kind of uh, loyalty and not. Um, but it was always a problem for, uh, actually, for other Protestants too. I mean, Calvin famously finally developed his, his uh, theory of the lesser magistrates. Um, it, a private citizen could not rebel, Calvin thought, against the ruler, but a lesser magistrate, one who held a public position, was authorized to do so. So, I mean, to try to work it out in a way that does justice to Romans 13 and still lets you go after the bad guys that you want to go after um, uh, takes a little uh, exegetical ingenuity. Did you hear him? Um, he said that the problem I'm thinking about uh, is, uh, is related to the notion of the primacy of conscience and whether the person who's having this problem, being a virtuous evildoer, um, uh, has, not, uh, need, has not developed his conscience to the point where he sees the truth uh, needs to be done. Did I, did I get you right? Exactly. They haven't uh, fulfilled their... Uh, 
they haven't fulfilled their responsibility to know the truth, and if they did, they wouldn't be in the position to be uh, to need to be a virgin sequel tour. Um, I want to say sort of yes and no to that. I mean, there's a side of what I said that agrees with you. I, when I said that we shouldn't savor the tragic too much, it's kind of uh, sort of delight in thinking about how difficult and tragic these sort of the sorts of circumstances that I described are, um, uh, and uh, uh, see ourselves as just sort of enmeshed in a web of evil through which there's no getting out, uh, kind of, um, as if we can't see a way through uh, it. Um, and, and I, uh, I, don't want, uh, I don't want to underplay that uh, possibility. Um, I, I probably have less confidence than you that um, uh, that we can be so sure about the formation of our conscience um, uh, that we can be confident that it's been well formed and that hence we will uh, know what is objectively the truth. I think that the, I mean, I guess I wouldn't be drawn to thinking about this problem of virtuous evildoers if I didn't think that the uh, human psyche or the human heart, whatever you want to say, is, um, is, more com is so complex that we can't necessarily always, I'm not, I'm not prepared to be quite so confident about um, uh, what my uh, conscience tells me. But in principle, I don't want to deny there's something to what you say and, and um, that we may well let ourselves off too easily sometimes. The world's a messed up place. Uh, there's a lot of evil out there. Um, uh, this is what I need to do right now. Um, I'll do it honorably. Uh, but that's a little too easy uh, a lot of times, for sure. Um, yes. If it's too hard, I will. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if you heard her or not, but she wants to know if uh, she, she's, he was coming at it sort of from the side of conscience and you're coming at it from the objective side of natural law, but whether uh, the view of natural law doesn't uh, make it a little, uh, and, and the fact that uh, the natural law is available to all of us make it a little hard for me to be too sympathetic to virtuous evildoers who ought to know what uh, uh, that can be done. Well, there's natural law and there's natural law. Um, um, uh, the, the natu I take the view, which I actually first learned from a, uh, from not personally from, but from reading a, uh, a political theorist who taught at Notre Dame uh, for many years, uh, Ed Gurner. Um, uh, the, uh, the, nat the natural law is self-evident, but it's not obvious. And to say that it's self-evident is to say that it shines by its own light, that it's not, you can't finally prove it from some more fundamental uh, propositions. But it's not obvious in the sense that any rational person just looking around will necessarily come to see it. Um, uh, uh, Gurner used the example from Aquinas of the, uh, the uh, uh, marauding uh, German tribes in uh, northern Europe who, um, uh, who uh, regularly uh, you know, in, invaded other uh, uh, peoples and took their stuff and uh, so forth, but who when they began to settle down and form their own settled communities, began to learn that there are some things that you can't do in um, uh, public life. They learned the natural law, which had always been self-evident, but had not been obvious to them uh, before that. I think the same is true for, uh, uh, for any of us. Um, uh, it, it's a mistake to think that any uh, rational person just opening his eyes, looking around, thinking clearly, uh, will necessarily come to see what the natural law requires. You have to first be a person of a certain character. Your character has to be well-formed. Um, and Part of the issue of the virtuous evildoer is the question about whether any of our characters uh, are quite all that well formed uh, or not. Um, so, so yes, there's something to what you say, but I don't think it's gonna it's gonna do everything that you might hope it would do. Yes. <laughs> 
seem to me like the kinds of examples of virtuous evildoers that you discussed, that there are maybe two different kinds of examples. And so I wonder what you think of this distinction. So um, Robert Adams, in his book, The Theory of Virtue, distinguishes between motivational virtues and structural virtues. And the former are things that have to do with having the right kinds of motivations, valuing the right things. And the latter have to do with things like courage and self-control, being able to carry out the things that one um, one's goal, the things that one values. And it seems like some of the cases have to do with having the wrong motivations, but then being good at carrying them out, like being courageous um, and so able to do what is in itself an evil thing, um, even at uh, cost of oneself, perhaps. And other examples have to do with having some good motivations, even while um, having other bad motivations. So being willing to take part in, in an unjust war, even while putting limits on um, the things that one will do in that war. So I wonder if you think that that's a useful way of distinguishing between these kinds of cases. Um, you notice how uh, I always said that I, I never knew more in my life than when just after I finished taking my general exams as a graduate student. Um, and it's been a process of forgetting uh, ever since then. Um, see, he, he's never going to know more than he knows right now. Um, uh, I'm sorry to offer a discouraging word for the future there. But, um, uh, well, I, I, I guess I don't have a problem with uh, uh, the Adams distinction, these, but these are different kinds of virtuous evildoers, right? You're, you're simply kind of parsing more carefully um, the, the several possible ways of des describing people, all of whom might still be thought of as uh, virtuous evildoers. And if that's what you're saying, then fine, good. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on board uh, uh, with that. Um, uh, I mean, I guess we could go on to think about whether one sort of these actually is, is a more paradigmatic example of what we might really mean by a virtuous evildoer. I mean, I think there would be further questions there, but the basic point, I, I, I think, I, I take it as I agree with that. this has to do with someone, some early Eastern Orthodox bishop? Well, no. okay. <laughs> um, I was just wondering if there are some examples of virtuous wrongdoers in our, um, in our reaction to them that might have to do with us um, attributing our experience of obedience to somebody in a radically different context, right? So my See, she didn't give me an Eastern Orthodox bishop, but she did give me uh, the guy I usually just refer to as Constantine, but uh, it's the same Constantine the Great. Um, uh, well, uh, um, that engaging in virtuous evil doing is, I mean, the noun still governs there, and it is therefore still evil doing, um, will require repentance. Um, 
I take to be clear. Um, uh, so, so that much, uh, that much seems uh, seems certain uh, to me. You know what uh, form that repentance uh, will take, how painful it will be, and so forth. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, it, it may, for all I know, given differences in our character, it may be may have been easier for Saint Constantine the Great to um, uh, repent uh, uh, of whatever he did than um, it would be for uh, me to repent of uh, my stubborn little uh, sins because I just maybe hang on to them more. So, so I, I'm not sure about the business about the, the necessary pains and so forth, but that, that repentance uh, will surely be necessary is true. To me, the more interesting question, um, though, you know, maybe I should, I don't know if I should call it interesting or not exactly, but is whether you can repent in advance. I, mean, I, I think you can't, and yet it's a great temptation in, in some of the kinds of circumstances that virtuous evildoers think about. I know I know that this, that what I'm about to do is wrong, but it needs to be done, um, uh, and I'm sorry in advance uh, uh, for doing this, but I have to do it. Um, uh, the, the, the concept of repentance in advance is to me a, a more interesting one in this context than the repentance afterwards, but um, uh, I'll grant, uh, I think basically what you said is true about the, the pains of repentance afterwards and what form they take. Um, I don't think there's any rule about how that would be distributed. Um, yes, you could. Can everyone hear me? I'll repeat it if you can. Um, Ryan Schindel, uh, graduate student of St. John's College. Um, uh, My question has to do with how you might uh, approach uh, uh, not so much the subtraction as an actual subtraction. How might it relate to Christ in the world? Okay, he he wants to know. Um, he's asking about the uh, the tragic conflict of goods in the world, which sometimes might be a conflict between two goods that it would seem cannot be reconciled in uh, the circumstances. Um, uh, what we should say about that, and then how this relates. I'm not quite sure. It's, how 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 that is drawn up into the life that follows Christ? I, mean, I guess uh, most people would be going uh, to be in seeking their good. They're violating that of another good, in some sense. and so they're uh, I guess virtuous people do it. Some understanding in this more circumstantial. Uh, uh, so I guess I just how might yeah how, how might you how might um, Well, the, the, the eschatological sense of uh, sort of being on the way toward um, a day when the virtues really would be uh, unified um, uh, is not, I think, um, is, not, is not taken by itself a satisfactory answer uh, to the problem uh, because we still have to act uh, here and now. Um, uh, even as we're on the way. Um, I don't want... I, I, didn't, I, I want us to, to sense the, uh, the difficulties that the virtuous evildoer faces, um, to understand that we ourselves um, might not be so virtuous uh, in some circumstances and to appreciate all those difficulties, but without as I said at one point in the talk, without savoring the tragic too much, because that guy there is still right to some extent that we, sh you know, we, we should not too easily assume that this 
seemingly tragic conflict of goods, uh, that there's no way through it, uh, that there's no way uh, out of it, that there's not um, uh, a virtuous deed uh, to be done uh, here. So um, uh, on the one hand, we, we taking, taking the problem seriously should make us um, reluctant to judge too quickly. Um, on the other hand, we shouldn't take it so seriously that we just uh, throw up our hands and say it makes no difference. It, we, you know, we don't need to try to think this uh, through. And it seems to me that um, drawing it into the understanding uh, uh, of a life in Christ is a way of saying um, God will overcome this uh, one day. Um, that doesn't make the problem go away right now but it means that I can address the problem not in the sense that this is, um, this is a world hardly fit to live in anymore, but that this is a world that God's in the process of redeeming, and I can address the problem with a certain kind of hopefulness. I, mean, that, I would say something like that, and I don't know if that really addresses your question or not. I guess, uh, could the virtues themselves be mutually exclusive? Could the virtues themselves be mutually exclusive? Well, I mean, there, uh, very great scholars have disagreed about that question, okay? Um, uh, I, I would want to say to that, no, they, they cannot be, but I grant that I would say it ultimately on a kind of theological ground, uh, uh, not on a, uh, an analysis of the virtues alone or thinking of the possible circumstances in which they might seem to exclude one another. Um, but on the ground of uh, uh, what God is at work uh, doing, and that's to move well beyond any kind of standard philosophical thinking about the virtues at that point. That's, I mean, I, I couldn't answer it any other way. I think experientially, they often do seem to exclude one another, or often maybe too strong, but sometimes do. One more question. Um, Related to him? You have Only to say that, yeah. <laughs> I am. Um, but my question is about faking the virtue. Um, I have a lot of clients who do things under economic pressures, and you know, if they steal a diaper from Walmart, to them, this is that's the virtue, and they're not sorry when they come to court. But the state expects a certain amount of repentance, and I have to tell them this is what the state expects to see. So, is there anything wrong itself in faking? Here, she wants to know if it's wrong to fake virtue on certain, in certain circumstances um, when, I mean, these would be circumstances in which you don't actually think it would be a virtue, but in, in, your, in this case, the, the court thinks of it as a virtue and things will go better for you if you just appear to agree with the court, uh, even though the truth is you don't. Um, Actually, I think that probably um, there is something wrong with faking the virtue, though it would be a hard thing to ask of the woman who stole the diapers in the circumstance that you, you described. What's wrong, what would be wrong with faking the virtue would be that you owe the court an honest statement, an honest understanding of why it's view is wrong. Um, uh, and that's what citizens all owe uh, one another. Now, that's easy for me to say um, and hard for her standing there uh, in the court, and if she faked it, I could probably find other people I'd think more ill of than, uh, than her uh, for, uh, for doing that. But, but there is a case to be made for saying that, um, uh, I mean, among the virtues is a kind of honest uh, presentation of what we take to be the truth. Um, and uh, it would seem as if maybe we owe that uh, to others in those circumstances. But once again, um, just as I wouldn't want to be Churchill, I wouldn't want to be her uh, in her circumstances either. Um, you know, what would I do then? Uh, I don't know. Um, but, um, uh, but we should not finally decide what's right on these on the basis of what we weekly would, um, uh, would decide to do. Thank you.